Hey everyone, and welcome to the Crossway Podcast. My name is Josh, uh, and today I am excited to talk about something that has always really been near and dear to my heart, I think, Uh, something that has motivated many of my decisions that I've made in life and uh, even inspired the focus of some of my hobbies and my passions, Um, and that uh, topic is worship. Uh, And here's the thing. I think that many of us can easily fall into confusion about what worship, specifically what it means to worship God, actually is. Um, and the, and even though every Sunday morning we gather together and we sing together in worship, um, can we really say that we understand what it is that we're doing? Um, Because I'm convinced that if we actually got that right, if we truly understood what worship is and why we worship, then our lives and our occupations and our relationships uh, are going to be radically changed. So, before we jump right to that concept, uh, uh, the the concept of worship, I want to talk a little bit about our relationship with each other, because I think that the way that we come to respect and admire one another as people can actually help us understand what we're talking about when it comes to worship. So I want you to take a minute um, and sort of think about a few people that you really admire and respect. This is going to be sort of a thought exercise. Think of a few people you genuinely look up to. Uh, It could be a family member or a celebrity or musician, um, athlete if you play sports, whoever. Now, you might look up to these people for a whole bunch of different reasons, right? Because they're either they're super talented or maybe they're really wise and relatable uh, or they have accomplished things that you're striving to accomplish. But at the root of all of those things, at the very core of all of the the reasons you may have for your admiration for them sits their moral character, right? How morally good or morally bad that person is. And here's what I want to suggest. I want to suggest to you that your level of respect and admiration of the people that you look up to is directly linked to their moral character, Um, And here's the thing, I think you can see this more clearly by just imagining that those people you just thought about, right, imagine uh, your, uh, the the people that you admire, imagine if they lived in such a way that was morally reprehensible, right, morally awful. If you came to find out that the people that you look up to were morally disgusting, morally bankrupt, you would not only immediately lose the respect and admiration that you had for them, but you'd also recognize something else. You'd recognize that they don't even deserve it, right? They don't deserve it from you, not from other people. And I think that um, we've seen this happen, right? We've seen it happen a lot in Hollywood. Um, We've seen it happen with some major athletes, right? When you find out that someone has uh, sexually abused another person, or that they've intentionally hurt someone else uh, for whatever reason, we know immediately that those kinds of people, that those people who are doing those things, uh, or whose character is defined by that moral bankruptcy, those people are no longer worthy of the respect or the admiration that people once gave them. And I kind of think that this is universal, right? Because notice that even the people who continue to look up to people like that, um, they don't do so in spite of their gross moral character. They usually just try to justify how those people didn't actually uh, commit acts like that or, um, you know, they, they aren't really morally bankrupt and so they're actually still worthy of respect and admiration. Um, But uh, besides that, the point is that we all recognize other people's character, their moral character, as ranking on this sort of scale of moral goodness, right? Um, And and this is sort of subconscious, but we all do it. And at the very bottom of the scale would be people that we know to be terrible people, right? They're morally empty, and they don't deserve to be looked up to. For example, Hitler or Stalin, people like that, right? I think that those are some some of the more obvious examples. Um, but also at the same time, the higher up on this sort of scale, this moral scale that we, th- we subconsciously have, 
um, that someone falls, the higher up, the more worthy of our respect and admiration, admiration they become, right? Think of somebody like a Mother Teresa or, or somebody who's done a lot of good in the world. Uh, we recognize that they're due a certain level of respect and admiration. Now, how is this connected to worship? What, is, what does any of that have to do with worship? Well, if you think about the sort of this this analogy that we've been using, the scale of moral goodness, you can see that if someone were to sit at the very top of the scale, right? If somebody were the highest on the scale, they would be a person that was morally perfect, right? Um, there's nothing higher than perfection, right? And, and in fact, the person, the the perfect person. Uh, whose moral character sits at the top of this scale would actually be the very standard by which all other people are being compared to, right? They would have the perfect moral character that everyone else should be striving for, right? Someone who's never unkind, uh, someone who's never selfish, someone who's never insensitive, and whose character traits are the very paradigm of what it means to do the right thing, right? Who is perfect. And so if we knew who this morally perfect person was, we would recognize that they would be worthy of this sort of ultimate version of respect and admiration, right? A sort of complete and, uh, complete and supreme admiration. Uh, we'd recognize uh, that person as the one that everyone should be trying to be like. And that is what worship is. Right? Worship is the highest and most complete respect and admiration, and it is only appropriately pointed at the most uh, complete moral person. Now, you can probably sort of see where I'm going with this, but if, if you can't, let me just spell it out, make it clear. God is that morally perfect being. Right? God is the moral standard that we are recognizing when we look at other people and judge how closely they're measuring up to the top of the scale. Right? It is God's character that is the kind of character that we see as the goal for all of humanity. Right? Jesus affirms this uh, in Mark chapter 10 when he said no one is good except for God alone. Uh, and he affirms it again in Matthew 5 when he says, be perfect therefore as your heavenly Father is perfect. Jesus and scripture tell us that the one sitting at the top of the moral scale, the one we should be striving to be like, is God. So what does that mean for us uh, and how does this translate to us when it comes to our worship, specifically our worship of God? Well, I think first and foremost, it means that we need to recognize, and this is tough, we need to recognize that worship is not about us, it's about God. Right? I think a lot of people have the idea that when we gather together and we sing to God um, in worship on Sunday mornings, it's really something that's done in order to satisfy ourselves, right? Like some sort of collective emotional therapy. And so if we can't relate to the music or we feel like we aren't getting anything out of it, we don't do it or we pull back. Um, and yes, music can move people emotionally. There's something about music in general that puts us in touch with, with uh, uh, transcendent beauty, right? A reflection of God's beauty. And through music, we can experience real relatability and vulnerability. Um, but worship, on the other hand, is not about us, right? It's something that God is worthy of. And I want to emphasize that part again, our complete and utter adoration of God is something that he is due. Uh, he deserves it, and he's the only appropriate recipient of it. And so what that means is worship should be given to him, whether we feel like it or not, uh, whether you like music that's associated with worship or not, uh, whether the band on Sunday morning is leading you in it well or not. Um, and again, like I said, that's a tough thing to do, but let me illustrate this a little bit. Uh, last year, during uh, uh, during our now youth pastor Chandler's birthday, uh, about ninety eight percent of the youth that attended that service 
almost at the top of their lungs, saying happy birthday to him. Now, why did they do that? Let's think about this. Why did they do that? Well, for like 20% of them, probably, it was because they thought they were being funny or hilarious or something. They were singing it all weird and, you know, how how youth act. Uh, But for most of them, it was because they, they sang this to him and they participated in this because they wanted Chandler to know that they were acknowledging him. Right? Happy Birthday isn't their favorite song or their favorite style of music, but they sang it anyway, and they did it in such a way that reflected their acknowledgement of Chandler. And that is a more appropriate way of viewing our singing together when we come together and we worship God. Right? It's a collective response to him as the perfect person as the appropriate object of our complete adoration. And we do it because we want him to know that we recognize that. Now, obviously, uh, singing to God is not the only way to worship him, right? Anything you do that acknowledges God as the ultimate standard for your life uh, could be considered to be worship. But there is, I think, something truly special about coming together and acknowledging that fact um, as one united voice, right? And the combination of the body of Christ and the beauty of music, acknowledging the holiness of God is sort of this all-encompassing, unique experience that we have the privilege of presenting to God as an offering every week. So, I want to challenge us to think outwardly the next time that we gather together to worship God. Uh, Let's present ourselves to God in a collective acknowledgement of Him as our holy and perfect Lord. Uh, When we worship God together, let's come as givers instead of takers, remembering that only God is the appropriate aim of our worship, and especially not ourselves. Well, thanks so much for listening, guys. If you are interested uh, in hearing more episodes of the Crossway podcast, you can find them on our YouTube channel, on our Facebook page, um, or you can go to crossway.news and see them there, or Spotify, Apple Podcasts, any of your uh, favorite streaming platforms. Thanks, guys, and we'll see you next time. 